next on The Sheila Smoot Show. Antiques all around you. Are you sitting on a gold mine or a pile of junk? How to convert those mementos into hard, cold cash. But if there isn't a market for it, then it, it doesn't matter how old or how good it is. Then, don't buy the coin with the intention of thinking that you're going to be rich. We're all about antiques and collectibles in this edition of The Sheila Smoot Show. The Sheila Smoot Show starts right now. Welcome to The Sheila Smoot Show. You know, the popularity of programs like Pawn Stars and Pickers seem to have everyone on a treasure hunt. Well, we're here among the thousands of items tucked away in a unique store called What's On Second. You'll find just about anything here, so it seemed to be a real perfect place for today's show. First up, in today's tough times, people are looking for solid investments that make money. In fact, money, gold coins, rare bills are a popular way to put cash into the bank. But not every coin is collectible, and some of those bills can be downright bogus. So here in our version of the Antiques Roadshow, a warning about so-called collectible cash. This magazine ad offers three uncut sheets of $2 bills for $144. The ad says buying the sheets makes you one of the really smart ones. With fancy terms like vault processing and seldom seen, it certainly sounds like a smart buy. But the actual face value of this $144 offer is about $24. This same company offers $2 bills customized for each state in the union. They're just $19 each. But remember, it's just a $2 bill with a sticker on it. And it's not just bills. Coins like this one stamped with President Obama's face are another item being sold as a solid investment. These dubious deals are just some of the many offers you have to really stop and think about before you buy. We asked our coin experts about these novelties being sold as investments. If you want to buy a President Obama coin, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, or a coin that's advertised on TV. Just call your local dealer, call somebody that knows what they're doing, and ask them what these coins are worth. You know, don't buy the coin with the intention of thinking that you're going to be rich, that it is a solid investment, because these coins are basically novelty coins. The companies selling these items try to lure you in with certificates of authenticity and throw around terms like mint or reserve. Our expert says these should be warning signs to anyone thinking of taking the bait. You see on TV all the time these uh, you know, advertisements for coins that are layered in pure 24 karat gold from the mint or from the vault. A lot of these coins are taken that are face value and they're layered with pure gold. It only takes about 25 cents worth of gold to layer a coin. And people are paying $19.95, you know, $39.95 for these coins that are, that are only worth a buck or two. Now, you know, people need to be aware that if a coin is not made at the United States Mint, it's just a token or a metal, and it's strictly worth the metal content within the coin. You need to be even more careful when shopping for things like gold bullion or other precious metals. What bullion is, is the term means a coin that is sold for its metal content only. Uh, now there's a small premium on top of that for the minting of the coin. Know who you're dealing with. Uh, know the price of these metals before you purchase them. Um, you know, check, do some homework, find out what an ounce of gold is selling for. It's called spot price, and spot price is the current rate of an ounce of metal, whether it be silver, gold, platinum, palladium, what have you. And classic coins are another area of concern. Remember, just because money is old or in great shape doesn't mean it's valuable. A lot of people have the misconception that, you know, just because a coin is old or they have never seen one before, that that automatically equals high value or value at all. And remember the ad for the $2 bill? It says, we're bracing for all the calls. My advice, don't bother to dial. 
And back to those ads we showed you. They all use fancy logos that look official, so don't assume you're dealing with the U.S. government. If you're considering a purchase of something like state quarters or other currency, check out the site moneyfactorystore.gov first. That's moneyfactorystore.gov. It's run by the United States Treasury Department, so you should get an accurate look at pricing. Now, here's a look at what's coming up next. Coming up next on The Sheila Smoot Show. You should buy what you're interested in, I think. And if your instinct tells you it's a good piece, then I would go with that instinct. The Sheila Smoot Show continues in a moment. This portion of the Sheila Smoot Show is brought to you by Atmosphere Home Essentials, your source for modern and contemporary furniture. Welcome back to the Sheila Smoot Show. We're here on location at What's On Second, a very unique shop filled to the roof with collectibles and antiques, from the strange to the sublime. You're probably going to find it here in Steve Gilmer and Michael Wilson's shop. So, what's the difference in an antique and maybe a collectible? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Federal Trade Commission says, by law, an antique is anything at least 100 years old. A collectible is just about anything. The age is not important except if it's labeled vintage. In that case, it must be at least 50 years old. Did you get all that? With a slow economy, many people are unpacking their mementos, dusting them off, and looking to sell them for some extra cash. But before you head to the attic, there's something you need to consider. Just because an item is old doesn't mean it's valuable. There's three items you need to check before trying to market your memories. From typewriters to teen idols. The one thing these items have in common is they're old. Many people think because something's old, it's worth a chunk of change. But that's a common misconception. Experts say while age does have an impact, there's really three factors that determine what something is worth. Rarity, condition, and desirability. The first item on the checklist, is it rare? If it's scarce and hard to find, you've got 50% of an item's value made already. Even mass-produced items like cameras can be valuable if it's a rare model. Second on our checklist, what's its condition? Condition makes up about 25% of an item's value. Cracks, chips, missing parts, or defects will affect that value. An original box with an item will typically make it worth more, especially if the box is in mint condition too. Third, is it desirable? Antiques and collectibles tend to follow cycles meaning different kinds of antiquities are desirable at different times. Memorabilia from the 70s may be desirable now, but three years from now, it may not. Desirability makes up the final 25% of an antique's value. So the next time you're considering selling your antique or your collectible, remember, if it's rare, in good condition, and something someone wants, it may be worth a little cash. So, now that we've done our checklist and you're ready to sell, how do you even get started? That's one of the questions I asked Steve Gilmer right here at What's On Second. First of all, let's talk about how you decide to do this store. Well, I had been on the road selling antiques at uh, shows around the southeast for many years. And as the price of gas went up, I needed a new venue. It was time to come in off the road. And I looked around in various places in Birmingham and I decided uh, Jim Reed had moved downtown at Reed Books and I started looking downtown and I found this wonderful building. It has the old original terracotta tile floors and the pressed tin ceilings and I just walked in and fell in love with the building and, and uh, sort of signed like a lease. Antique, right? It is, yeah. It has a history of its own. It has. Uh, graffiti on the walls upstairs that dates back to the, the 1940s and uh, it, it's just a, a wonderful piece. Now what does it take to have a collectible? What does it take? Well, yeah. you... New, old, 
collectible, lots of stuff, one thing? Well, <laughs> one thing can be a collectible. If you want a collection, you probably need more than one item. Mm -hmm. But uh, collections don't have to necessarily be a collection of cookie jars or pocket knives. You can have a a mixed collection of, uh, of, of just whatever appeals to you. Mm -hmm. A lot of people collect uh, odd assortments of things that they decorate with and uh, just little tchotchke things that mm -hmm. they lay around the house. They may not want 200 cookie jars, but they may want a cookie jar to uh, put in the kitchen and actually enjoy and use. And that's something you collect. Antiques, that's a different Genre. Well, antiques, you think more in terms of antique furniture, uh, porcelain, uh, silver, things of that nature. I call it the decorator antiques. We don't feel that need uh, at, at this particular shop. We have a lot of young people who shop here. And uh, I learned early on in this business that um, people tend to buy what they remember. So we started uh, buying merchandise that young people who grew up in the 80s and 90s remember, that's just yesterday for me. But it's a lifetime ago for them. And, uh, and they are collectibles uh, that these kids are buying. Star Wars, uh, patches to go on clothing, uh, uh, Smurfs and, and the little troll dolls yeah. with the, the hair that would stick. Do you stick, have a uh, Rubik's Cube? We do have a Rubik's <laughs> Cube, as a matter of fact. Frisbees, hula hoops, yeah. you know, uh, it's, um, it's, it's endless. Let me ask you this, um, you know, I'm going out to a sale on Saturday. That's yeah. one of the things that people do. Mm -hmm. These estate sales and all things. Give us some advice on how to really find a good deal, find a good bargain and what to look for. Well, it depends on what you're interested in. You should buy what you're interested in, I think. Uh, if you're interested in depression glass, look for depression glass. Get on the internet and, and do a little research on the patterns and see what it's selling for on eBay and on other websites that, that sell depression glass. And if your instinct tells you it's a good piece, the price is reasonable enough, uh, I think that I'd like to have this, I would go with that instinct. Trust your instinct and uh, you'll, you'll get better uh, at buying if you um, do a little homework. We get calls all the time from people who are interested in selling items and it's hard to give any kind of evaluation without seeing the item so quite often if it's something that we might be interested in, I'll tell them to bring it in. Uh, it could be a box of board games or uh, it could be some military collectibles, something along that line. I've got the best job in the world. Not only do I get to deal in fun merchandise, but I get to deal with fun people. They're in a good mood when they come in and they're anticipating finding some surprises. At this point in my life, it's, uh, it's really great to be here. The Sheila Smoot Show continues in a moment. Need some answers? Call the Sheila Smoot Show tip line at 286-TIPS. That's 286-8477. Welcome back in. I'm Sheila Smoot. We're here at What's On Second. And today's show is focused on the thrill of the hunt. For many bargain shoppers, knowing the next great find is right around the corner gives them that rush. You know, the same can be said of clothing shoppers. Consignment stores are a great place to dress on a dime. Thanks to the economy, being frugal is now fashionable and consignment shops like this boutique in Homewood, Alabama are busy with the budget conscious. Consignment shops stock designer labels for a fraction of their original cost. So for many customers, browsing for big name bargains has become kind of a sport. Don't confuse consignment boutiques, however, with thrift stores. A thrift shop is run by a not-for-profit organization to raise money for charity. A consignment shop displays specific high quality merchandise and pays the owners a percentage when and if their items are sold. The days of dark, musty shops are gone. 
Modern consignment stores are brightly lit and well organized with displays. Tracy True Dismukes, owner of Collage Designer Consignment, gave us this shopping advice. First, look for quality of workmanship and materials. A quality item might cost more at resale than a new inferior item. But the workmanship, the style, and the value of any well-made item, from a handbag to a designer outfit, provides more value at resale. Also know the retail prices of items you are shopping for. That will help you appreciate how much money you will save by shopping resale. Explore a variety of resale shops to find several that will become your favorites. Each shop is unique and so is their merchandise. Get to know the staff. Sign up for their mailing list to receive sale notices in their flyers or newsletters. And finally, check all items carefully and know the store's return policies before purchasing. And there's one more change to consignment shops, attitude. You'll find today's savvy shoppers love to save money, enjoy the unique items, and savor the thrill of the hunt. Tracy really had some great advice. To learn more about Collage Designer Consignment, go to our website at smoochshow.com and click on the Consumer Squad link. The Sheila Smoot Show continues in a moment. Need some answers? Call the Sheila Smoot Show tip line at 286-TIPS. That's 286-8477. Welcome back in. I'm Sheila Smoot. Thanks for joining us. You know, we've been here all day long at What's On Second, and I've just had just a fun time browsing around all of these aisles. But if I may turn a bit serious, each week we set aside time to profile nonprofits working to make our community better. This week, we meet the great volunteers at Cahaba Valley Health and see firsthand the vital work that they do for the needy. The mission of Cow Valley Healthcare is to provide vision and dental services for underserved people in Jefferson County and uh, Shelby County. We focus on Hispanics, but we take the first 55 people who come to every screening. We do 16 screenings a year. They're primarily at churches, and at probably half the screenings we do, we conduct, we have to turn people away because we have over 55 people that show up. People will start showing up at screenings at 9 o'clock in the morning, even though they don't start until 1 o'clock. Cobb Valley Healthcare started in April of 2000. It all started because I adopted my daughter from Guatemala in 1979. So my daughter made me aware of Hispanics, but then I've always been in healthcare. I'm a nurse and a nurse practitioner. I worked at UAB for 28 years, then I was recruited to Cooper Green to be the palliative care specialist at the Bond Gilead unit. And at that time, I realized how difficult it is to get health care if you're not insured. It's extremely hard, even if you were born here, even if you speak the language, even if you have access to the system. If you aren't born here, you don't speak the language, you maybe don't have all your papers, then it's almost impossible. We have the most amazing cadre of volunteers. We have thousands of volunteers. At every screening, we have 35 to 40 people that come and help us. Um, I mean, we only have three and a half members of uh, staff members. Um, so we have volunteer eye doctors, both uh, um, optometrists and ophthalmologists. The ophthalmologists usually staff our vision referral clinic. We have volunteer dentists. We have dentists who will come and help with the screenings. Other dentists, like today, we have t three dentists who are volunteering our dental clinic doing actual dental procedures on people. Uh, plus we have two dentists here that are doing examinations. Volunteers say, I had no idea how, how many people came. And they say, I'm so happy that I came and was able to serve for an afternoon. Really changes their perspectives of the people who need care. Anyone that wants to volunteer can. Um, but also, of course, we need funding. We don't receive any, any government funding from local, uh, county, state, or federal government. We don't receive any government funding. We do receive some United Way funding. That's like 20% of our funding. Uh, we also receive funding from foundations, from churches, but primarily from individuals. 
many of our patients need funding for complicated dental procedures. Some of our patients need funding for um, eye surgeries, and we do have a special surgery fund. So if anybody wanted to give to that, uh, we have people waiting in the wings who actually have no funds for um, dental surgery or for eye surgery, uh, especially cataract surgery. People are unable to afford that. And uh, when you get cataract surgery, then actually a big screen comes off of your eyes. Get on our website, www.cahabavalleyhealthcare.org. Such a really great group of folks. To learn more about Cahaba Valley Health, particularly if you want to make that donation and they need it, go to our website at smoothshow.com. The Sheila Smoot Show continues in a moment. We're protecting your rights. The Sheila Smoot Show now continues. Today we've shown you how to be a savvy coin collector and we've reminded you just because it's old does not mean it's valuable. And if you want to dress in designer wear, we've shown you how to do that too. Our thanks to Steve Gilmer and all the folks here at What's On Second for hosting today's show. Remember, I'm always listening to your side. We'll see you next week.